Dear colleagues, first I would like to express my warm thanks to the organizer for this uh, invitation to this very interesting uh, event here in Grenoble, uh, Capital des Alpes. I'm very much honored uh, by the request to give this uh, lecture. Um, the organizing Laboratoire d'Excellence System provided me also with a flyer here um, um, about their impressive research activities. In this flyer, I read the following lines. Since the dawn of time, mountains have demonstrated a willingness to innovate, to innovate by implementing adaptation processes in economic, environmental, cultural, and social areas. The understanding of these mechanisms is a critical issue in deciphering the effects and forms of contemporary changes." Unquote. I was particularly happy about the formula since the dawn of times, because I'm a historian, and I thought perhaps I would not be totally misplaced uh, for the subject matter. So in the present lecture, I will try to give a feedback uh, to the statement of the LabEx item, and that on the basis of an emerging global history uh, of mountains. The lecture uh, will start with the question how research on the past uh, can sharpen our sense for future developments. This is not really evident. Uh, there is a kind of playing game uh, going on between regression and progression in time. In interview situations, journalists happen to say things uh, like this. Oh, you are a historian and you have studied uh, about the mountains and the Alps in past time. Can you please tell me how they will look like in 50 years from now? Uh, a classical reaction to that kind of hyper-future orientation is the famous quote from William Faulkner's Requiem for a Nun, where a main figure says, the past is never dead, uh, it's not even past. Uh, or in French, le passé n'est pas mort, il n'est même pas passé. So this is, uh, of course, uh, a nice bon mot, uh, but it's also rhetoric, uh, and in academia we cannot leave it there. So, the first section of the lecture is uh, called As Time Goes By, A Path for the Future. The second section concerns global and ecological uh, turns in mountain perception during the so-called Rio process since the 1990s the birth of a major ecosystem through the United Nations Agenda 21 with a prominent mountain chapter. The third section broadens that mainly Western perspective, perspective and touches upon various religious impulses in non-Western attitudes to upland um, areas. In, so, in search of elevation, not only for the body, but also for the mind. All in all, you will see that these voices of mountain issues sum up to a bewildering diversity. So global history, I think, can offer some methodological advice to find one way through the mountain haze. That's the last question that asks, uh, what can we learn from it? My colleague Martin Price uh, will then go on with a lecture about the mountains in Europe. According to the abstract, he points to diversity too, uh, by providing information on many-sided developments, uh, research policies. In my contribution, I try to be a bit complementary to him. I will include mountain regions outside of Europe, uh, and I hint to the dimension of perception and religious forms thereof, <coughs> which are not that familiar to us here. And I do so in a rather narrative style, 
uh, without a great deal of uh, data slides. <coughs> Let us start with a future and historical perspective. First remark. This course is about the future can be studied empirically in past times. And they can be empirically tested only in the past. We can ask, how did intellectuals in the 18th century, say the French philosophers, um, what did they say about the future? And which elements of these prognoses realized or not realized in the 19th century? However, we have no possibility to do so for present-day forecasts. A classical study in that direction is the book Futures Past uh, on the Semantics of Historical Time by historian Reinhard Koselek. He points to the increasing relevance of the future put forward by the Enlightenment, the Lumière. For Koselek, the transition to modernity is characterized by a new orientation towards a secular coming age, expressed above all in the key term of progress. Other historians have also looked at the rate of realization of earlier forecasts, and they came to the rather sobering conclusion that future discourse is often a counter-discourse to present voices and later not realized as expected. The great period of progress was the 19th century. Since the 1960s, the term is in decline in public representation, a kind of replacement or substitute can be seen in the upswing of the term innovation. Here uh, you see a graph of frequency of innovation in public discourse for the 20th century. The values are on the rise from 1950 onwards and ever since. The figure is produced by the Angram Viewer of Google Books based on an electronic reading, as you know, of millions of books. Unfortunately, this big data approach does not so far offer the possibility to distinguish different uh, genres of uh, publication in order to follow the usage of the word in specific currents of public talk. Yet it is the first approach, and in comparison to the earlier progress, the present innovation seems to be a bit dismantled. Uh, while progress carried along a big message and hope for the entire humanity, or at least for the centers of the so-called civilization, innovation seems to be uh, more contained and uh, more self-sufficient. <coughs> Let us sum up. Our look into the future is constrained by major social conventions <coughs> and points of thought, and historical experience shows that we should not overrate our possibility of accurate forecasts. But in-depth studies of past trends can certainly make them more solid. In this sense, the time perspectives of different uh, scientific disciplines are interlinked. In order to get an idea now about the background, uh, of the emerging global history of mountains, I would like to present now briefly some authors, works, and research trends. <coughs> this is a cartoon of Fernand Brodel, the famous French historian, some years before his death, with a head imprinted as a globe. Uh, the forehead shows the outlines of Europe, Asia, Africa, with America, the oceans, Brodel is writing a book, and there is no doubt that this will be a global take on history. Uh, the picture probably refers to the publication of Civilisation Matérielle, Économie et Capitalisme, which was finished in 1979 and dealt with many parts of the world. 
uh, there have always been uh, some traditions of universal history writing in, in Europe, but uh, Brodel and the Annals School gave them new impulses, and 10 or 20 years later, uh, global history experienced the true boom. Uh, with new research projects, journals, associations, networks, chairs, and jobs in universities. The methodological debates in this boom area deal with the relative value of comparison between different parts of the world, with entanglement between movements and actors <coughs> far away from each other, and with challenges raised by post-colonial studies and policies. In both English and French, there are quite a few terms for these currents, such as entangled history, connected history, histoire croisée, uh, histoire à part égale. During this boom period, as you know, globalization has made great advances in the real world, which has been criticized first from the left and now uh, increasingly from the nationalist right. Brodel is also well known for his environmental or geo-historical approach. In his famous thesis on the Mediterranean in the 16th century, he starts with a long chapter on the mountains around that sea, saying succinctly, tout d'abord les montagnes, mountains come first. There, and in his later books, he referred repeatedly to an earlier French scholar, to Jules Blache, an interesting geographer from this town of Grenoble. In 1934, Blache published a first and pioneering study of the relationship between men and mountain in a global perspective. This here uh, is uh, the cover page with a counter slope picture, I guess, somewhere here in the Western Alps. Uh, at the time of publication, Blush was a kind of crown prince of the Institut de Géographie Alpine, which had been founded a quarter of a century earlier and had already acquired a high standard. The knowledge and library were, however, massively bias towards the Alps and towards Europe and did not include many accounts of other continents. This correspond, corresponded naturally to the, to the institute's task and to the historical situation. Yet as a consequence, the book modeled the mountains of the world mainly according to the Alps, which covered only a few percent of the global upland area. One could characterize this approach with the parlance, the West and the rest, uh, credible in the age of colonialism, but quickly losing attraction afterwards. Having said so, one has to add that Blush was a serious and very imaginative author. He ended the book on a pessimistic note. In modernity, he says, people turn away from mountains and leave them archived. <coughs> Après avoir joué un rôle capital aux origines du peuplement, il semble que les montagnes voient les hommes se détourner d'elles. For a long period, Blush pioneering study <coughs> remained rather isolated, but in recent times we can observe an emergent global uh, history of the mountains. Uh, I give you here some titles. Desbarbieux and Rudolf, Les Faiseurs de Montagne, Imaginaire Politique et Territorialité. Fulton and Colleagues, Terre Haute, Terre Basse, uh, Les Disparités, that's a special issue of the trilingual journal Histoire des Alpes. Phil Montero and Colleagues, Mountain Pastoralism and Modernity, that's a special issue of the journal uh, Nomadic Peoples. Hall and Cooper, Crossing Mountains, the challenges of doing environmental history. Uh, Mathieu, the third dimension, a comparative history of mountains in the modern era. 
some of these works start from the observation that there has been a great change in perception of mountains in recent time. A new global take on them with the environmental policies of the United Nations in the late 20th century. And that is the subject I would like now to uh, discuss. I think it is useful in many respects to have an idea of the so-called real process uh, for the understanding of the mountains in our present times. This is the cover uh, of the Time magazine in early June uh, 1992. It shows the famous Copacabana and reads, Rio, coming together to save the earth. It entrusts this major task to the Conference on Environment and Development, the so-called Earth Summit, which was convoked by the United Nations a few days later. <coughs> The magazine pointed to the prominent and numerous lineup of world leaders, green politicians, non-governmental organizations, native spokesmen, and people all of all sorts that would show up in Brazil. Indeed, the conference broke all records and expanded into a cultural happening of global magnitude. Uh, it was the outcome of the so-called ecological turn, which had changed Western minds since about 1970. <coughs> One central document of the Earth Summit was the so-called Agenda 21, a political program for the 21st century that can be considered the first global uh, constitution for the environment. As a result of an intense and successful lobbying activity, the chapter 13 of the agenda was fully dedicated to the mountains, uh, depicted as fragile and vulnerable, and officially promoted to a major ecosystem on the same level as oceans, uh, rainforests, and deserts. The principal lobbyists were a, a loosely organized group of concerned scientists operating under the name of Mountain Agenda. This was the brochure they prepared for the conference in order to gain the approval of the many national delegations. The cover image shows a dramatic and most tragic event the mountain Huascaran in the Peruvian Andes, uh, where an earthquake had unleashed a massive rock collapse and mud flow in May 1970. <coughs> the mud flow uh, devastated a small town nearby and killed uh, about uh, 18,000 persons. The picture was of course meant to stress the urgency of action in favor of the mountain ecosystem. The brochure was explicitly prepared in the, on the occasion of the Rio conference, quote, with the purpose of raising the status of mountains on the world's development and environment agenda. And the, an interesting side effect of this uh, continuous political problematization was a shift in the attitude concerning the definition of mountains. In the 19th century, many geographers tried to define mountains in a general way, above all by referring to elevation that was now accessible to precise measurement much more than in early times. But soon the discussion showed that the altitude cannot be the only standard. Slope, for instance, is crucial to popular assessment of mountains as well. When Jules Blush uh, published his global book in 1934, a famous geographer introduced it by saying, une définition de la montagne qui soit claire et compréhensive est à elle seule à peu près impossible à fournir. Or in English, a clear and comprehensible definition of mountains 
is almost impossible to deliver. This was uh, Raoul Blanchard uh, speaking, the director of the Institut. Later on, the political pressure uh, to reduce complexity <coughs> increased a lot. In the years around 1992, the real process, uh, the concerned scientists uh, working for the inclusion of mountains in the global agenda first tried to keep the problem issue specific. They stated that there were several useful definitions of mountains for different purposes, but that quote, the search for a unitary definition of mountain is to chase a chimera. A few years later, however, the computer made the chase successful. For a global project of mountain forests in 2000, Valerie Kaposch and colleagues proposed a general model. In this study, they said, we use digital data on elevation to define mountain areas by empirically testing combinations of elevation, slope, and local elevation range. <coughs> this approach was accepted with a few modica modifications by many further studies. So we have here a, a very interesting historical example of a definition that <coughs> to be nearly impossible and yet realized later uh, under the influence of uh, certain political and technological factors. The definition was also the basis for a new representation of the globe produced by the Mountain Agenda for a UN conference 10 years after Rio. This map here shows the countries of the world according to their mountain part. The red colored uh, countries have mountain shares of 50 to 100 percent. The orange uh, countries shares of 25 to 50 percent and so on. The quantification is based on the aforementioned computer model. When compared to earlier unbalanced uh, mountain uh, descriptions, uh, this map here stands out as a global political program rooted on ground evidence and linked to the social organization of nationhood and universal criteria. <coughs> Many activities of the mountain agenda were supported by the Swiss Confederation and in particular by the Swiss diplomacy. When I did empirical research about these actions 10 years ago, uh, I interviewed, amongst others, the head of the Swiss delegation to the Rio conference. I was curious about the various motivations leading up to state agencies uh, being involved in this uh, mountain direction. The head of delegation was from Fribourg, and the interview was in French. When I asked him about the profound motivation for the engagement, he responded with a remarkably short answer. On a Swiss, on a Devash. Uh, we are Swiss, we have cars. At that point, I knew that there was little sense in digging any further, since this was uh, clearly a statement about uh, identity. Uh, it was a national confession to we could perhaps link this confession to an interesting statement made by the organizers of this present conference in uh, their program. Quote, mountainous and alpinity provide a basis for mobilization around diverse and uncertain uh, issues. The sentence refers to the symbolic aspects of mountains that can be of an astonishing flexibility. Going back to the 18th and 19th century, we see, of course, that not only mountain research started mainly in the Alps, the Alps were also home to early nature celebration, uh, to tourism, mountaineering, winter sports, technical conquest, military deployment, and so on. The surprising new celebrity of the mountains of, of the Alps uh, could provide empowerment to remote areas. 
it could re reassure the people <coughs> that their region and their valley was something valuable. And one cannot blame these people when they started to think that the Alps in general were just like their region. I call this self-referred way of thinking Les Alpes à moi, in honor of a book of that title published in the Italian province of Belluno. It is a process of inter-regional identification not often explored in a systematic way so far. Not all Alpine regions, however, became famous. The map of celebrity of the entire area uh, is dotted with a series of hot spots, leaving other uh, areas, regions in the shadow. This mountain peak was rather unknown to a general audience up to 1865 when the first ascent by an English climber and his men ended in tragedy. Four persons, persons fall to death. The Matterhorn, Le Cervin, depicted by the art critic John Ruskin some years before the drama. It is an illustration uh, of his work, Modern Painters, which was a lengthy and successful manifesto for mountain painting. Ruskin was taken in uh, by Romanticism and its spiritual dimensions. Not by chance, he called the mountains cathedrals of the earth, <coughs> religious spaces that should not be disturbed by profane intruders like alpinists and too many tourists. Yet his own work contributed to the fame of the mountains he showed and celebrated with so much skill. Today we count over 230 Matterhorns around the world. That is, mountains called by that name because of some resemblance uh, with its uh, conspicuous shape. Everywhere the people uh, seem to discover similar peaks. And the Matterhorn death toll has risen to over 550 persons fall to death since the first tragic ascent of 1865. This toll is currently more than twice as high than the death toll on Mount Everest in the Himalayas. There the count starts in 1922 when the first serious attempt to climb the world's highest peak was undertaken by a large British expedition. The expedition was already accompanied by a filmmaker and the advertisement for the movie looked like this. Climbing Mount Everest, the cinematograph record of the Mount Everest expedition of 1922. You could join for a price of six pence. The climbers with oxygen masks and tanks look like parachuted from a strange planet, or like the priests of a new cult. Indeed, some were discussing in serious if mountaineering was a new religion. Everest sits on the border between Tibet and Nepal. In order to approach uh, it, explorers had to cross one of the two countries from British India, but both were long close to foreigners. Especially with respect to mountain climbing, the meaning of which was hard to convey, the rulers harbored political and religious reservations. The British mission to Tibet in 1904 resulted in the temporary occupation of Lhasa. The exiled Dalai Lama had not signed the forced agreement with the mission, but now, at least in theory, mountain expeditions could obtain permission to enter his territory. The Tibetan authorities put their religious concerns aside, especially in periods when tensions with China mounted and they had to rely on British weapons and diplomatic support. <coughs> the expedition of 1922 comprised a dozen European gentlemen 
along with the aforementioned filmmaker, a Tibetan translator, a small military escort, and a great number of local porters, cooks, and other assistants. <coughs> In addition, there were around 300 pack animals. On April 30, the long column arrived in military formation uh, at the Buddhist monastery at the northern entry to Everest at over 5,000 meters. This picture shows part of the building and the way to the peaks. Here in Rongbok Monastery, the abbot subjected the British leader to a thorough examination. He came to formality, he was always formal, but his dislike of the strange undertaking of the British was unmistakable. The British promised to kill no animals in the district. So the Buddhist abbot imparted his blessing and dismissed the expedition with the following words. As our country, is bitterly cold and frosty, it is difficult to others than those who are devoted to religion not to come to harm. As the local spirits are furious, you must act with great firmness. Uh, here we see a still from the movie taken on that occasion. You see General Charles Granville Bruce, the British leader, listening to a translated message from the Rongbok Lama. Both leaders recorded the particular moment in their autobiographies, and their descriptions diverged considerably. Bruce writes that he presented this uh, strange mountaineering action uh, as a pilgrimage, and admitted, uh, frankly, that this was a white lie. But the white lie uh, did not help them to the summit. Uh, the first attempt failed in tragedy, as did the next one two years later. Not until, until 1930 was it again possible to obtain official consent for an expedition. In answer to the English ambassador's request, the Dalai Lama responded, From our point of view, almost every snowy mountain in Tibet is the seat of the gods and of the guardian deities of the inner religion, who are very jealous. Yet in deference to the wishes of the British government, and in order that the friendly relations may not be ruptured, permission is hereby granted. The Sherpas, who came above all from the populations living on the Nepalese side of Everest, and who were the preferred assistants recruited by mountaineers, uh, found themselves in a peculiar situation. Aside from the very real dangers of their wage labor, the Sherpas had to overcome their Buddhist reservations against mountaineering. They had also to gain the support of their lamas and steer their foreign employers away from the most serious transgressions of religious commandments. Uh, for instance, killing, killing animals. In the mountains, therefore, they often followed the prescriptions with <coughs> particular rigor. Let's leave it there. In Asia and in some other parts of the world, mountain landscapes <coughs> were and still are empowered by religion. By religious belief, very different in form and intensity. This can be shown particularly well when the indigenous notions clash with upcoming mountaineering, as we have just seen, uh, or when they clash with tourist projects, as in quite a few regions worldwide. I would like to present now briefly two recent uh, cases of the clash between mountain perceptions, the first one in uh, northern India, the other one in western Canada. It's a page of the Hindustan Time, a uh, Chandigarh edition in February 2006. <coughs> the title reads, Divine Intervention, No, God Shoot Down Ski Village Project. 
the article refers to a $150 million resort planned since 2004 by an American company in Himachal Pradesh. From the very beginning, the project was opposed by NGOs for ecological reasons. But soon, traditional leaders joined the protest and mobilized large parts of the population. In Himachal Pradesh, we find the interesting phenomenon of the so-called traveling gods. <coughs> that is, richly decorated deities, gods, uh, carried on stretchers by the people of their village to other villages and eventually to central places of the mountain region. It is a kind of parallel organization to the state. Uh, each village having his god in competition with other village gods and in subordination to the principal god of the ruling dynasty. The picture here uh, shows traveling gods in a densely packed gathering of believers. They want to hear what the gods say about the tourist project through the voices of their oracles. Uh, this happening of 2006 has been the biggest in a long time. The article explains, I quote, the gods' conclave held after 35 years had all the making of a grand spectacle. As the clock struck 11, one by one, the oracles uh, started to go into trance. As the caretaker of the temple went to each oracle, their bodies were racked with spasms. The gods spoke staccato into a guttural, in a guttural voice, only to emphatically shoot down the Himalayan ski village proposal." Unquote. This divine spectacle and verdict was a blow to the giant project, which was later <coughs> cancelled by the Hindu government and turned into a case for the high court. <coughs> This Indian example mobilized a strong and consistent regional belief system against the foreign intervention. In my second example, uh, there were and still are several uh, spiritual currents running partially parallel and partially against each other. It is about the Jumbo Glacier Project in British Columbia planned and contested since 1991. <coughs> this is the current website of a major protest organization. It tells us, keep Jumbo wild forever. Take action now. You can of course donate to the organization, but you can also uh, join the colorful resistance <coughs> movement in its various forms. Uh, from combative public rallies to the staging of a distinguished music concerto high up in the mountains on a glacier. At the, at the beginning of this large and controversial uh, tourist project stood investors from Japan uh, in search of economic opportunities. They mandated an architect in the capital town to prospect and plan the resort. The architect happens to be of Italian origin and he uses images from the Alps to promote the case. He recycles, for example, Ruskin's metaphor and says that for him, the beautiful mountain landscape resembles a great cathedral and that he wants to open it to everybody. If the, uh, the metaphor, however, is con uh, contested by other groups with other religious ideas, the Indian native population, or First Nation, as they call themselves, argue that the cathedral is in reality a closed space. They believe the open land to be sacred wherever they live together with their ancestors. Other urban-based groups of uh, deep ecologists celebrate the notion of wilderness and point to the fact that the image of cathedral stems from old Europe, particularly from the Alps, 
which have been taken over and spoiled by technical civilization anyway. They are the ones who proclaim, keep Jumbo wild forever. We must add that many villagers there tend more to say, keep Jumbo inhabited forever, and the important politicians join the investors with their motto, keep Jumbo growing forever. At this point, we should steer towards a conclusion. You may wonder why I spoke so long about religion. The main reason is that religion concerning mountains is not very familiar to us here in Europe. Except for some local customs, it emerged only as a sideline of romanticism, not very much supported by the church. But when we ask ourselves about mountain perceptions elsewhere, in Asia, the Americas, and in other parts of the world, uh, religion often comes in as a major force, and with a great deal of cultural diversity too. Tibetan Buddhism is very different from Hindu-inspired traveling gods in a nearby Himalayan uh, region. This leads us uh, to the affirmation that all these voices and these mountain views sum up to a bewildering diversity. Let me recapitulate the principal mountain views that we have <coughs> happened to come across. I repeat them in the accidental order of their appearance here in this lecture. Mountains have always been willing to innovate. Laboratory of Excellence, Italy. People turn away from mountains in modernity and leave them archaic. Jules Blasch. Mountains as global ecological problem. Rio Earth Summit. Mountains as cathedrals of the earth. John Ruskin. Snowy mountains in Tibet as seat of the gods. Dalai Lama. Keep mountains wild forever, or inhabited, or growing uh, forever, uh, urban active, eco activists, uh, villages, politicians. Um, I do not try to, to comment all these positions and the relationship between them. Instead, I would like to point to experience, uh, experiences from global history that might help us navigating through the mountain haze. As a symbolic encouragement for this methodological exercise, I use a painting of the German Swiss artist Paul Klee. Um, the, painting, the painting is uh, entitled The Conquest of the Mountains. It shows a kind of mountain train uh, leading upwards and it can be admired today in the National Museum of Modern Art in Tokyo, thus representing another kind of mountain circulation around the world. The painting is from 1939, when Klee had to escape Nazi persecution in Germany. And the current Japanese art experts interpret the vaguely hostile atmosphere as a reflection of the times. Be that as it may, our train ride has three stops. First, global history can be an important support for the self-positioning of our research area. And it can warn against the naive and <coughs> self-referential model we have called Les Alpes en Bois. One Alpine region is not like the Alpine area altogether, and one mountain system is not like the upland area of the world. The Alps are, for instance, much more humanized than many other mountain ranges. Second, time matters. And it matters <laughs> at the level of explanation and theory. Path dependency is a powerful force, and it should be carefully assessed against context factors for example, environmental constraints. We have started with the sentence that mountains have always been willing to innovate 
by adaptation processes in different areas. Here we can add that beyond adaptation, mountains have seen numerous self-contained developments, for example, cultural processes. The various belief systems mentioned in this lecture cannot be deduced from the respective mountain territories. Third, global history can teach us to better distinguish uh, between major and minor trends, which require differentiated action when it comes to matters practical. Major trends cannot easily be stopped and invested, inverted through political intervention. Instead, we should rather focus on channeling them in an acceptable uh, direction. Take the example of wilderness, so much discussed today in the Alps as well. Is the spread of forest cover and wilderness a major trend which will inevitably transform the alpine landscape? And does it necessarily include the reintroduction of wild animals like wolves and bears? Or does the changing animal population belong to the matters within our political reach. Thank you very much for your kind attention.